Good morning, everybody. I know um, people probably didn't sleep real well staying up after one or two o'clock watching the bad news of what's going on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so we're a little tired and we're a little weary and weak, but we're very excited about still uh, always, always proceeding on with science and scientific discovery and education. And so welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, Dr. Bhatnagar was having some technical difficulties, so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Ted Smith. <clears throat> and uh, it's always interesting reading people's CVs and knowing where they come from. Uh, Ted Smith, just like Aruni, is an extremely well-educated uh, gentleman. He has uh, BS in biology and psychology and experimental psychology. I'd love to sit and talk to you about those experiments. Um, he works now at the Christina, <laughs> Christina Lee Brown Institute, um, and he's also an associate professor in Farm Talks. He is our director for Healthy Water and Soil. He had gotten his postdoc fellowship also at MIT, spent time in Boston and Suffolk and Tufts. So, uh, and then he went on and <laughs> continued education and got an MBA here in 2013. So. He's got a lot of uh, uh, ex uh, education experience, and he's going to tell us how to how he's used all of that to apply this to wastewater genomics for environmental medicine. Welcome, Ted. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I know most of you probably wonder uh, why we're talking about sewage at Grand Rounds. And um, I always wonder why I'm giving this talk so close to mealtime. So I hope everybody's uh, digested their breakfast because uh, we're going to have some good images today. Um, I want to convince you that, um, you know, this is a, a tool that is clinically relevant and is one that we're very excited about um, here at the Environment Institute and in our Division of Environmental Medicine. So proven track record. It's, um, you know, it really is a complement to a great uh, series of strengths we have uh, here in the Department of Medicine and environmental health. And um, it's exciting to see the growth of this whole category, you know, across farm talks, uh, internal medicine, and, uh, you know, lots of groups uh, here at UofL are one of the leading authorities in environmental health. And it is, uh, it's exciting to, to try to develop some new technologies and new tools to help answer some of those questions. Um, I hope to convince you by the end of this talk that um, this is a, a promising um, platform for uh, genomic pathogen surveillance, uh, in addition to lots of other kinds of uh, population health surveillance. But we're going to focus um, a, a bit on the genomics today because I think it's relevant to the kinds of uh, things that we've all been reading as it relates to this latest stage of the pandemic. So, you know, by way of a little bit of history, some people, you know, think sewage and medicine, and they'll go back to John Snow and, you know, uh, our great anesthesiologist who, you know, potentially invented the field of public health. Um, but, you know, th that probably is a story we should understand as um, patients that helped us find sewage, uh, that helped us end, uh, you know, kind of a, a pandemic. Um, but this, the story here is not patients finding sewage, but sewage finding patients. And so that, that story was really uh, started by uh, James Wilson in Scotland uh, in the early 1900s, and that was with typhus. And, um, you know, uh, this was the, the first time that we were able to look at uh, sewage and uh, see evidence of infection and then uh, follow that trail, if you will. And so, uh, you know, his uh, pioneering work essentially, uh, you know, in Edinburgh was able to uh, use samples of sewage to identify places where uh, we would likely find uh, patients. And um, that was sort of the beginning of this whole kind of uh, uh, the using it as a tool of interrogation and investigation. It w really wouldn't be until the 40s and 50s that, um, you know, the, the lab methods and the field methods would, would kind of get a little more um, harmonious and we could actually, you know, in this case, go door to door and, um, and, and what, what's called sewer tracing, you know, where you would actually just follow the signal until you find the household. And, um, you know, that's, um, that's probably a level of, of, uh, of 
uh, interrogation that you know is probably uh, mind-boggling in this day and age to imagine that we were going to go looking door to door for anything, but um, certainly uh, validated the whole idea of the field that you know we we could find human infection with this marker in the wastewater. And, um, it's probably not a surprise to any of you who, who followed the eradication of polio, but in the developing world, this is the primary tool for determining where polio is present. Uh, and that's really because, you know, many of these countries just haven't had the luxury of a healthcare delivery system, you know, that's been able to be the front door for uh, public health infectious disease monitoring. So, you know, here in the United States, we have relied on you all to, uh, to tell us, you know, what, we're, what, what level of uh, community infection we have. And it is because we have uh, a robust healthcare delivery system. Again, in these developed, developing nations, it's not the case. So, you know, everything here in uh, yellow and blue there are examples of countries, you know, where uh, we to this day have um, sewage surveillance going on for monitoring polio. And I don't know if you saw the news, but in just the last uh, few weeks, uh, Malawi has um, has a case of polio after it had been declared polio free. And actually, our team is uh, working uh, with them and the Rockefeller Foundation to try to um, establish a, a, an upgrade to their laboratory capability. Um, so it's a it's very much still with us today as a, as a tool, an established tool. In the, in the United States and in a lot of the developed world, uh, this kind of an approach has been used, um, you know, not for infectious diseases where we have a, a, a healthcare system that's, you know, up to the task, but, you know, really for things like illicit drug use and, um, you know, other, you know, sort of behavioral indicators of, um, of uh, health problems. And so uh, our colleagues at Arizona State University uh, have a, what they call the, the Worldwide Wastewater Observatory. And they have been, um, you know, gathering samples of wastewater from all over the United States, you know, to um, characterize the, um, the opiate epidemic and especially the introduction of some of these very dangerous um, uh, pharmacologic agents like fentanyl. And uh, that's, a, that's been a, an approach. Here you can see in Tempe, Arizona, which is the community that ASU uh, works with most directly, they'll map out the city and they have an ongoing and regular uh, monitoring of these opiates in, uh, in the wastewater. And really what they're looking for is urinary metabolites of these opiate uh, specific uh, drugs. And so, you know, that's an that's a, that's a infrastructure that was in place in the United States in parts uh, of the country. Um, you know, just to sort of give you a sense of uh, how to think about this maybe as a cost-effective tool for answering some of these questions. Here, uh, a study out of Italy, you know, looking at smoking behavior, um, looking at nicotine uh, metabolites in the wastewater in these different cities in Italy corresponded remarkably well to the much more expensive surveying methods for trying to figure out smoking rates in these communities. And so, you know, um, while the, the, the signal itself may uh, you know, be kind of uh, unsavory and unappealing to look at uh, in its sample form, you know, the, if you interrogate the data you know, in a rigorous way, you, know, you can get something of use. So fast forwarding to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, this was all the news in, um, in uh, sort of the summer of 2020 when uh, the folks at the University of Arizona made the front page of the whatever, the Washington Post, um, you know, with their uh, discovery that they could use this method to identify um, asymptomatic cases in a dormitory. And um, just about every university uh, with a PCR machine, you know, had tried some version of this during this pandemic. Um, a couple of universities like Arizona, you know, had, had really systematized the work. But, you know, that was a, um, an early case of validation that uh, this tool could be relevant in this pandemic. And really this is because the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus sheds uh, in, uh, in through the feces as a sort of an ancillary path. It's not obviously it's not the, the primary path for infection uh, propagation, but it just is a sort of an ancillary feature of the virus and so that really opened the door for this whole category. 
Um, and so as long as, you know, this, this thing continues to mutate, as long as it continues to be effective um, at uh, infiltrating the GI tract and um, the propagating, then we'll you know, be able to use this tool uh, to, to get a handle on it. So, you know, just sort of quickly, um, you know, what are we talking about here when we, when we talk about using sewage, you know, for these clinical interrogations? Um, the way to think about it is it's a pooled sample of um, stool and urine. Um, and so, you know, it's, it is going to be that mixture. It's not, we're not just able to answer the question, did this come from a stool? You know, did this come from urine? Uh, we're, we're getting a mixed kind of soup. And, and, you know, in that soup is a lot of other things. So the matrix in the wastewater, you know, includes lots of other chemicals, lots of debris. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to sort of, this is what keeps a lot of people out of the field because, you know, the, the, the concern about inhibition or contamination or degradation from these other agents, you know, is a, is a relevant uh, concern to, you know, work on and, and come up with strategies for working around. The advantage of this kind of a platform is that you get defined uh, areas of people. And so you can think about this as a way to get a pooled sample from a frame of people above ground, if you will. And that uh, helps us then sort of answer epidemiological questions. I think it's important to note that, um, you know, this kind of public health surveillance um, is in an unregulated territory. And, it, you know, we can talk about different levels of oversight or ethics concerns. If you think about the research activity, you know, when we went to RIRB, uh, you know, they uh, quickly declared it not human subject research because it is anonymous uh, and our methods were not looking for human DNA. That, um, you know, so, so it's, it's not human subject research, it's, it's public health uh, surveillance monitoring. Um, you know, there are real questions that the dormitory surveillance brought into frame around medical ethics and, and a, a broader ethics conversation that we could have if you'd like. Um, but it is just important to know it is a sort of a Wild West uh, uh, category. So we're very far from a CLIA laboratory at this moment in time. No standards for lab methods, uh, no standards for um, sampling approaches. And so, um, you know, we're waiting for the CDC or the EPA to step up and establish some kind of uh, rules of the road for, for how this work should be done so that we can compare things from community to community. And so we're not looking at that, we're looking at uh, what's on the right. Um, so uh, we're doing our best to make, uh, make a signal out of all that noise. And uh, I'll give you just a quick uh, background on the physical plant. So here's our laboratory, um, it's beautiful. Uh, most uh, uh, sewage, sanitary sewer systems in the United States are uh, gravity-based systems, so households um, are, you know, plumbed and the uh, sewage pipe is at a, a lower grade and it falls until it can't fall anymore and then we install a pumping station and we pump the sewage up and it falls again until it makes its way to a, a wastewater treatment plant where it is decontaminated and then released into waterways. And uh, so, you know, that's what we have to work with and there are opportunities then in that infrastructure to go get samples. If you look at the lower right, and it's not a great image, but um, this is actually what, uh, what we're dealing with underground. And so there's lots of red arrows going in lots of different directions. And so, you know, to do this work here in Louisville, we have to sit down with MSD, looking at their GIS maps and trying to figure out how to draw a fence around an area that's easily contained so that we can say with certainty, the sample came from people who live in this area or live and work in this area. Um, important to know that there's lots of different ways to, um, to frame uh, the, the pooling. And so everything from uh, a sort of campus level, you know, where there might be hundreds or thousands of people. And so we uh, have been working with Commissioner Stack and Commissioner Cruz uh, and the Commonwealth monitoring 14 uh, state prisons since uh, early uh, 2021, and um, there, you know, it's obviously of concern, it's a vulnerable population, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're obviously incarcerated, so you know, there's a lot of risk uh, to the population. So having this tool as another way to understand uh, whether there's missed infection in that population could be very important. Um, if, if you go any smaller in scale, you run into feasibility issues. So while we could go dorm to dorm or 
apartment complex to apartment complex, the, the costs and logistics are, uh, are ridiculously prohibitive. And then, of course, we get into the ethical concerns, um, you know, the closer we get to um, a small group of people, right? Then in the middle, you know, you have work that really the University of Louisville has pioneered uh, in the United States, and that is working in sort of in multi-neighborhood um, catchment areas. And so think of it as like a couple of zip codes, a couple of familiar neighborhoods. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to look at this, uh, this particular pathogen you know, where it seeds, how it spreads, how quickly, um, you know, love the intensity and extent. And so we have 12 catchment areas that we've defined across Jefferson County that we've been following since uh, July of 2020 on a weekly basis and often a many times a week basis. And way up in the upper right, you'll see uh, sort of the crudest level of analysis you can possibly do. And that's where you just go to the wastewater treatment plants. You stay out of the neighborhoods and you just go to the wastewater treatment plant where all the wastewater ends up and you, uh, you do your sampling there. This is actually how this uh, field works all over the United States uh, in the main. And so, um, you know, if you've ever seen any news stories about, you know, what's going on, you know, in Boston or whatever with the sewage, you know, that I promise you that's coming from a wastewater treatment plant. The issue that, uh, that we'll have when you're looking at that is the health question you can answer uh, working at that scale is really, you know, answer the question, is Omicron in Boston? We can answer that question, but we can't answer the question, well, where in Boston is Omicron, right? Um, and so, you know, we're, we've been working hard to think through these scalar issues because they relate directly to interventions um, and concerns around treatment. Just quickly, you know, how you get these samples, uh, you know, you can either dip a bucket in and, and get something that's probably not very representative of very many people. You can use these fancy methods that we use where we grab uh, samples every 15 minutes over 24 hours where we feel pretty good that we got a snapshot of the, the, the whole community that, that was there or you could do what our colleagues at Stanford do, and you could go to the wastewater treatment plant and get something that they call primary sludge, you know, which is essentially um, uh, looks as the texture of soil. And so they use that kind of a method to, uh, to find pathogens there. Um, the basic uh, technology here is one that you're all familiar with. Um, it is identical to what we do with clinical samples, except for this a small front end process where we have to get rid of the garbage. And so uh, there's a sort of filtration steps that we need to take to get the sample into a form that we have a shot at finding that viral RNA. Um, but you know, from the moment we precipitate it out, um, uh, we are uh, in a position to use all the same, you know, sort of primers and probes that we use for nasal pharyngeal swab samples. Um, and of course, we've added in the last year um, uh, sequencing uh, to the operation. So we're, we're both detecting and quantifying with PCR, and then we're um, sequencing those fragments that we find. And so um, to get a sense of sort of how this fits into the, the big picture, so the Louisville uh, health department uh, uh, put us into the community's uh, testing uh, framework, and this was way back in June of 2020, but, you know, the idea would be simply we need to have the testing capacity to test people that are symptomatic and uh, all healthcare workers. We need to have testing capacity that can test um, people that are at high-risk settings and test those people regularly, and then we needed to have some ability to understand the prevalence um, of the of the actual community infection and to do that dr botnagar shared at the last grand rounds from our division the uh, co-immunity project and how we've done uh, random sampling of the public over many waves an ambitious and wonderful project uh, doing both active infection and serology um, uh, he had the, the the brilliance to introduce this idea of, of if we add wastewater in to this larger testing framework we might be able to figure out what its utility is. And I'm grateful that we've done this experiment in that context because we've learned a lot about its, uh, its utility and its validity. Um, a reason to be in all of these smaller areas is, as you know, there's not one Louisville, there's many Louisvilles. Uh, and so these communities have uh, quite different uh, complexions, right? There's different uh, socioeconomics, there's different race, there's uh, different density. There's uh, all kinds of things going on in Louisville that could be relevant to um, the um, seeding and spread of an infectious agent. To give you uh, some comfort that we actually think we know what we're doing here, um, 
you know, on, on the upper panel, uh, you'll see we've aggregated uh, the levels of uh, SARS-CoV-2 that we've isolated out of the wastewater. Uh, here you'll see sort of March to up to last week or the week before. Um, and then in the lower panel, I've taken the Jefferson County hospitalization data for, uh, for COVID. And, um, you know, I, I hope I can convince you we're measuring the same thing. Uh, and even the magnitude of, uh, in, uh, of infection viral concentration that we see is related to the magnitude of uh, what we'll see in the, in the healthcare system. And so um, we have seen that throughout the pandemic. And I think the, uh, the, the one real trick here is just like with clinical testing, you know, there's a, there are little pockets of variation that are, are sometimes difficult to stomach. And uh, it all makes sense when you look at it from a great distance, uh, it's a lot less clear in the, in the minutia. And so we're really working to try to understand the sources of variability and uh, try to get our arms around them. Give you a sense of what this looks like in an individual area. Uh, so uh, this part of Jefferson County has been a, a real problem in the last couple of weeks from, uh, from where we are, uh, just measuring the virus in the wastewater. You'll see, so Cedar Creek area, Southeast Louisville, um, you can see in the lower panels, you know, the level of virus that, that we recover in the wastewater, you'll see we've taken the health department's case data, we geocoded it back to this, um, this small area, and then we recalculated uh, the, the case rate. And so you'll see that the shape is about the same. It's important that we keep track of everything else that's going on. So for example, we also get vaccination data geocoded for this area. So we have about 60% vaccination coverage here. And so we see, you know, there were high levels of virus found in the wastewater, um, you know, high-ish levels of case rates. But if I compare that to the Shawnee area, where vaccination coverage is about 44%, um, we'll see that the viral concentration levels were much higher. The case rate was uh, still kind of in the same ballpark. And so we suspect under testing in the community and that they were missing cases. And we expect that, you know, the, the, the infection rates were just much higher, you know, probably due to the fact that there was lower vaccination coverage, right? So we, we start to see a whole picture coming together. I'll just say, um, you know, there's a lot of cheerleading we say in this whole space because it's exciting to talk about sewage and, you know, how we can find things in novel ways. But I, I, you, know, you all need to know the truth. The truth is, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of variation in this uh, in this particular application. Uh, some of that variation is related to what we don't truly know about shedding uh, in the stool. Um, we do know that the few times that people have tried to characterize shedding uh, fecal shedding, that we've seen tremendous variation from patient to patient, and that variation is both in terms of um, abundance of the virus and duration of shedding. Um, and then, you know, we've come just anecdotally to understand that these different new variants um, also potentially have very different um, shedding profiles uh, in feces. And so, you know, we have all of that variation to, you know, deal with. Then you have the complexity of trying to mirror, mirror it with uh, a different kind of testing framework. And so you'll see on the panel on the right, uh, Nicole Brickman from the EPA has been collaborating with us on, you know, how, how we should understand this signal. I'll just show you, if we took a sample of that yellow bar at a point in time, there's a chance that that point in time also aligns with um, somebody being uh, caught up in the PCR, you know, testing system. And so those red squares would be a time that we have a PCR clinical case. Um, but I assure you, we're going to be catching a uh, virus that's coming from people who are recovering and virus from people who don't yet know that they are positive and that the system doesn't know that they're positive. So, you know, you can start to see there's layers of variation that are gonna be present in this kind of methodology. So let's just shift for a moment to sequencing. So um, a year ago, literally a year ago, um, uh, the, the folks in the genomics core and bioinformatics core at the university uh, said, hey, we think we could figure out how to put this stuff in our, in our sequencing machines. And, um, you know, many people at that time, I recall we actually had a meeting with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House about the feasibility of doing this work. And I believe in that meeting, uh, the folks at the White House said it can't be done. So um, I'm pretty sure they'll never admit that they said that, but um, it can be done and we have done it and we've been doing it for a year now uh, here at the University of Louisville. So. 
Uh, here's a way to think about sequencing of this particular virus, and then we'll talk about other viruses and bacteria. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 uh, does not uh, end up in the sewer in a form that you would recognize in a clinical sample. So we don't have the luxury of a pristine, you know, full virus, you know, virus laying out in front of us, you know, for us to sequence. What we get is something that is degraded. So that RNA sloshes around with, you know, baby wipes and Clorox wipes and other kinds of things that are in the sewer, and it does get degraded, and we do pick up then fragments. So there is no documented infectious level, you know, virus in sewage. It is, it is degraded, it is infectious. And so uh, we have to deal with these little pieces. So I like to tell people we get a, uh, a baggie full of jigsaw puzzle pieces, and uh, those jigsaw puzzle pieces go to multiple puzzles. And so the job is to pull the pieces out and figure out which puzzle the piece goes to. And that's exactly uh, how we uh, approach sequencing of SARS variants. And so you'll see here, uh, with a big thanks again to the genomics and bioinformatics team, um, you know, we will then sequence uh, a relatively uh, short strand, maybe it's 150 base pairs, and we will look for, in this case on the on that right uh, x-axis, sorry, y-axis, you'll see the spike region and all the known uh, possible uh, mutations uh, in that region, and they're all associated with different variants. Uh, on the x-axis, you'll see different sample locations, and so in any given week, we get something that looks like this, and we're trying to figure out uh, which, uh, which mutations are present and then which mutations are associated with which known documented variant. So we end up making a beautiful little table like this where we're just handicapping um, how many mutations we see that are associated with a known um, signature of a variant. And so you'll see uh, uh, Omicron, our, our favorite latest variant, you know, has 27 mutations um, of, uh, of interest uh, in that region, and we are, uh, anytime we see more than half those mutations present, we will declare uh, oh, that that variant is in our community or in that catchment area. And, and you'll see we've been following all known um, uh, variants uh, since they've been characterized. And so right now, yeah, this is a very current snapshot. You know, we are in a community that is mostly full of uh, Omicron and has been for, for quite a while, although I'll tell you we've seen some other things. Um, to, to give you some uh, additional comfort that we're, that we're measuring the same thing that you're hearing about and seeing clinically, you'll see here um, over time how we've been able to um, follow each of those variant strains, uh, enter our community and leave our community. And so, you know, you saw back in uh, sort of in early 2021, you know, the, the alpha strain that was then uh, displaced by the delta strain, which has now been displaced by the Omicron strain. And so you can see as a proportion of uh, 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 SARS variants that we see, those proportions have changed over time, reflecting the competition uh, in the community. And here's another way to look at the very same thing. Um, so we'll, you know, we might find uh, a target um, in one place, uh, and then later, you know, we'll find it in lots of places, right? That's exactly what we've seen if you follow sort of alpha at the top, delta in the middle, omicron at the bottom. Um, uh, interestingly, um, we will find these things um, first in wastewater before clinically, and I think that's, um, that's another important advantage here is that we can understand when seeding events occur and then potentially when we need to think about how prepared we need to be and when we need to be prepared uh, for these things in our community. And so um, you can see the spread of Delta in our community over time from the wastewater Believe it or not, we saw it back in April of 2021, and just so you know, it wasn't actually declared a variant of concern until the 14th of June by the CDC. So we saw something that we didn't know to be concerned about, uh, and then we saw a lot more of it a couple of months later, and then you know, by June and July, it had started to take off you know, widespread in our community. And so because we're doing the sequencing, we have an archive of everything we've ever seen. And so Dr. Rochka over in bioinformatics was able to rewind the tape and say, hey, you know what, we saw this variant a little while ago over here. And um, that is a really powerful uh, tool to have because if we're waiting for people to develop PCR probes and primers to find very specific patterns of uh, genetic mutations, 
we're always going to be behind. We're never going to really know when things are present in our community. And so it's an extremely powerful tool for us. So, you know, here you can see um, we had detected it in these two uh, parts of Jefferson County um, early in December. And I remember being on the phone with Commissioner Stack about this because the governor was about to hold a press conference saying that we had found uh, clinical samples of Omicron in uh, Fayette County and in uh, Covington. And that was his press conference. That was what he was going to announce. And I called Mr. Stagg and said, hey, we, uh, we have it here in Jefferson County, too. And I know you haven't been able to find a clinical sample of it yet. And I know you will someday. But uh, I can confirm that we definitely have it here, too. And so they updated the governor's uh, talking points for the press conference. And if you're in a big city in Kentucky, you've got Omicron. Uh, looking at just the, the complexion of today, um, as I said, you know, we all know we're, we're a community full of Omicron that's hopefully working its way out. Um, it is a specific strain uh, called BA.1 um, that is predominant. We still have Delta in some pockets. Um, and so, you know, with Delta is, is still with us in places and I shouldn't be surprised to anybody, but it has not been truly displaced entirely. Um, but, you know, it's not very abundant. Uh, and then there's this BA2 that we all hear a lot about. And, you know, we found uh, BA.2 in the Cedar Creek area, Southeast uh, Jefferson County a couple of weeks ago. In our most recent samples, um, it had disappeared. Um, I'm sure it didn't disappear, but uh, in terms of our ability to detect it, you know, it, it was at such a low concentration. Um, you know, it's, we're not seeing the trend that would suggest that BA2 is, is rapidly growing in our community right now. And so that's something we all can take some comfort from. Um, so, you know, we, you know, I think we can all hope and imagine that, you know, perhaps BA1 was so successful finding targets that, um, you know, potentially there are fewer targets for BA2 to get to right now. And let's hope that's true. Just so you understand how we work with the state um, Department of Health, so there is a genomic surveillance program in the Commonwealth. Uh, that genomic surveillance program, um, as you might imagine, essentially is downstream from the clinical testing uh, that from these uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs. And so, um, you know, so when we started this work in February of last year, you know, maybe 50 swabs were being pulled, you know, for sequencing, which, you know, for a state of our size is, is uh, unlikely to find a needle uh, working with that kind of haystack. Um, over time, the state lab has um, developed more capacity, but, you know, you should just know that we're certainly not sequencing everything that's being tested clinically. And so genomic surveillance in the United States is always going to be an exercise of taking a subset of what we're getting, intercepting clinically uh, to characterize. So it is likely to always be missing things uh, just based on the, the, the low number of tests that are actually run. And so uh, we have a reciprocal arrangement with the state where, um, you know, they, they share information about what they see, we share information about what we see, and we then can choose to act, um, you know, together. So for example, you know, in one scenario that we've run a couple of times, we found something in the wastewater, it hasn't been intercepted yet in, in genomic surveillance by the state. And then we've asked uh, Dr. Aurora in the state if he could hold back additional swabs uh, in this particular geography to see if we can confirm the presence of that, like an actual case associated with that virus. And that has happened successfully a few times. The other scenario, um, the state had an outbreak they reported to the CDC in a nursing home of a, of a special variant uh, they, they called R1. Um, which uh, got a bunch of people sick uh, that were vaccinated uh, in this particular nursing home. And, um, you know, they submitted the sequence to the CDC and uh, called us and essentially said, here's what it looks like. Have you ever seen it in Jefferson County? And again, we could rewind the tape and we could say, have we ever seen this collection of mutations? And the answer was no. And that's a, obviously it was a source of comfort to know that, you know, they hadn't found something in a nursing home that was potentially running through the community uh, under the radar. So these are these are interesting and important scenarios to work hand in hand uh, with um, syndromic surveillance. So um, I think you all know that uh, the story of treatment for COVID um, is uh, is contingent upon uh, the version of COVID that we're looking at. And so you know one of the reasons that it's been so important to focus on uh, this Omicron surveillance is because of the. Uh, lack of efficacy of some of the monoclonal antibodies for treatment. So to understand 
you know, what we're, uh, what we're likely dealing with, you know, really also could be staged with healthcare delivery. So we can think about what treatments need to be available in communities based on the uh, presence and extent of a particular uh, variant. So, you know, again, there's, a, there's more work to be done on how we match up the staging of treatment to make sure treatments are available for what you're going to see uh, clinically. Um, there's also this whole issue of, of uh, quasi-species of, of these uh, variants and, um, you know, there's some belief that there are people who, you know, uh, harbor infection for, you know, such long periods of time, you know, that they, they could be sort of incubating uh, some of these variants uh, that, you know, that we're seeing. And so to, to really understand not just those variants that the CDC and the World Health Organization have identified as the ones that we're concerned about just based on case rate growth that they've seen, um, you know, we, we should be just as interested in some of these other you know, mutation patterns um, and, and maybe their relevance to answer questions that we still don't uh, fully understand. Like in the case of uh, long COVID, you know, are we looking at um, a more interesting uh, genetic uh, picture than we, uh, than we think, right? So maybe, maybe there is a sort of subspecies kind of a analysis that we could be considering for some of these long haul cases. Okay, and then just quickly, where we're going, um, I'm really excited. Uh, Dr. Uh, Melissa Smith uh, joined the university recently. She brought with uh, her just an amazing collection of platforms for genomic interrogation. And she, um, she, she uh, volunteered uh, to uh, expand our aperture to look at um, a wide panel of pathogens uh, in these wastewater samples. We call it a panvirome analysis. You'll see, you know, we've developed uh, a panel uh, that is looking for, you know, 3,100 viral species, uh, 15,000 strains, and um, have successfully run that panel. And, you know, just here's the sort of quick, the, the way it works uh, essentially is this, uh, as she calls it, oligo uh, capture fishing expedition where um, these uh, oligo sequences are uh, dipped into the uh, sample and they are, you know, they, they match up with um, these specific uh, patterns from these individual pathogens. And so uh, we, have, um, we have pulled those out, uh, fished them out, and then uh, sequenced them, amplified them, sequenced them, and um, have been able to then show what the composition of these other uh, viral contagions are in our community. And so you can see here, this is, a, there's one sample on the left, one sample of sewage on the right. And, um, you know, I guess we all shouldn't be surprised um, that there's, a, there's gonna be a lot of GI um, infections uh, if you're sampling in wastewater. Um, there's gonna be things from other species other than humans. Um, so we're, we're learning about the, as I think of it, the zoo that's in the sewer. Um, and so we're gonna have to figure out which are the human things and which are not the human things and you know how, how abundant they are. Uh, here's another visualization, thanks to Dr. Uh, Rochka in bioinformatics. Um, again, many, most of these, uh, you know, sort of the, the dark blue and green um, GI uh, infections. Um, but, you know, believe it or not, SARS is in there. Let me see if we could. So it's a tiny little um, yellow line at the very bottom. Um, so if you imagine the, the noise cloud that is the, the sewer system, it is full of GI infections um, and we are hunting for these other kinds of uh, uh, pathogens and you know, they're not gonna be as abundant. We shouldn't expect them to be. And so we're gonna have to work hard to figure out how to uh, tease them out. So um, today, uh, where we are with this work is we are working with the state on uh, establishing a panel of uh, pathogens and not only viruses, but also bacteria, um, fungi. Um, and what we're trying to do is match up, just like we've done with COVID, we're trying to match up uh, the things that are of clinical interest, say for the state or for our city, uh, that we we're looking for in hospital. Um, and so we call that syndromic surveillance, right? We're looking for a whole host of things and we're reporting them when we see them. So it's not just about COVID, it's about a lot of other things. Let's get the list right. And this is one of the lessons from, from this pandemic. Coordination with uh, the healthcare system and with public health 
really means using the language of the healthcare system and public health and, um, and, and doing a good job trying to mirror that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to come up with the same panel of concerning targets and uh, we'll go fishing for them passively, very cost effectively. It works great in cities. It doesn't work so well in, in remote places, you know, that aren't connected to sewage systems. But, you know, it is, uh, it is another tool, right, for us to see this. I don't want you to think uh, that um, it's all just wonderful. Uh, even if, as we leave SARS and all those fecal shedding issues, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do to solve for these problems. And so, um, you know, the, the mapping with the human data is, uh, is, is hard. You know, we believe that the case rate data that we get, you know, it is a form of convenience sampling. It isn't, um, it isn't the, sort of the ground truth. It's, it's an estimate of how much infection is in our community. So if we have another measure and we try to compare it to a measure that has flaws, it's gonna be very difficult for us to figure out what's going on. And so we're working very hard and again, with the CDC and others to try to, you know, elevate the conversation so that we're coming up with uh, better ways to understand the relationships between these things. Calibration factors um, um, for population, it's a big issue. Uh, you know, I won't hide from it. Uh, you know, we have people moving around our community all the time. It's uh, a fantasy to imagine that only people who live in these places are the people contributing to the sample. And so, um, you know, really getting a handle on how many people are, are, are represented in a sample is difficult. There's a lot of work that we're doing and others are doing on really trying to come up with other measures uh, that, that can help us uh, standardize for population that's present. Um, standard lab methods, I'm working closely with NIST and uh, Department of Homeland Security and the EPA and CDC on standards in this area because you just, you really can't even compare lab to lab uh, very well. Um, and we can talk about that in, offline sometime. Um, I mentioned disconnected systems, so if you're not in a city and you're not in a sanitary sewer network, um, you may be, you may be missed. And so uh, we're working very hard right now on, on frameworks for working with uh, disconnected populations. Uh, Dr. Aurora in the state, you know, is very interested in uh, job centers as one way. So in many parts of rural America, there may be an employer that draws from an area. Uh, so he's really busy trying to figure out how you might use um, those attractor um, uh, opportunities. Uh, we're gonna do some stuff with septage haulers, you know, people that actually uh, pump septic tanks and, and go to dump them at wastewater treatment. You know, we have some work to do. You know, nobody should, uh, you know, really be, we shouldn't have big, uh, you know, missing spots in our map. We should really understand what's going on. Uh, transient populations are a real challenge. Uh, I remember getting a call from San Diego uh, early on in the pandemic. And, you know, what San Diego looks like on uh, Saturday and Sunday is not what it looks like on Wednesday. Um, you know, millions of people move in to these tourist communities on, you know, for weekends and periods of time. And, you know, it's, it's a very difficult problem then to, uh, to, to make any, ascertain anything about what's going on when you have all that kind of churn. Timeliness of results is a, is a big deal. So, you know, we're, uh, there's a lot of pressure on, you know, shortening the chain of activities, right? So sampling in the field to getting it to the lab to, you know, getting the results. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in point of sampling technologies. They're very expensive. I think we're pretty far from realizing that. Um, you know, there's some issues that are, that are really just on the human side. And so um, I remember, you know, the, the calls we would get about like sampling in Jefferson County Public Schools. Well, uh, I'll ask you to tell me how many uh, kids you think defecate uh, at school because, you know, that's really going to be the limiting factor and how representative that is of infection in the school. So, you know, we've tried to use common sense about where this tool actually makes sense to use based on what we do know about people and their behaviors. Um, in fact, we have a, a subcontract with, uh, with the University of Kentucky uh, looking at nursing homes, and they, uh, they, had a, um, they had a small outbreak at one facility, wasn't caught in the wastewater because every one of the patients were in diapers. And so uh, that waste was going out via the solid waste garbage, not through the pipes. And so, you know, really thinking through these things, very important. Um, of course, there's the obvious things like, what are we gonna do about everything else that's in those pipes? Um, you know, and there's not an easy answer to that other than to, to, to really characterize it and understand how it might be fitting. Um, you know, as we move into bacteria, especially, you know, there's a whole secondary zoo uh, inside these, these places. So, you know, there's bacteria that are, are busy 
uh, propagating in the environment itself that you're sampling, and so how you know how does that get in the way of interpreting what's a human infection uh, versus you know what's something that's spreading in the sewers themselves? Um, and you know this area, this idea of like let's let's agree on what level of um, uh, catchment that we're dealing with, uh, I think is going to be important, especially nationally as a capability. Again, we can't compare apples and oranges, and we really need to think about what we're doing. Uh, and then acceptance, I'll, I'll just tell you, uh, Dr. Botnagar, uh, early on, you know, we, we were doing some other environmental exposure work. We sent, sent a proposal off to NIH, said we're going to use wastewater, and I believe the program officer said we're not interested in your wastewater. Um, you know, uh, since then, the NIH has done a full 180 degrees, and they had a whole RADx program only looking for wastewater projects. And we're hoping uh, that there's a increased acceptance as long as it comes with a healthy dose of honesty about what's going on. And then um, uh, it would be crazy to imagine I do this by myself. I couldn't possibly do this. Um, you know, it is really quite a team, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. Um, a lot of my colleagues uh, in the Division of Environmental Medicine and in the Myrome Institute, uh, certainly colleagues across the university in uh, genomics, microbiology, uh, bioinformatics. We have great partners in our city uh, with MSD, with the Health Department, with the Kentucky Department of Health. And we've really had some generous support uh, along the way. Um, and, you know, most recently, Louisville uh, Health Department uh, has been funding this, the Commonwealth has been funding this, uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, but then James Graham Brown Foundation, Alzheimer's Brown Foundation, uh, we've just had a lot of uh, a lot of support and a lot of good, smart people um, making this. So I thank you so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions if time permits. Wow, well, thank you, Dr. Smith. Go, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Kruger. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm going to start out and say I now really understand very, very clearly what uh, what this project is and. Uh, your slides were fantastic. Uh, the way you delivered it was fantastic. You answered a lot of the questions I was going to ask uh, as you started to talk, uh, particularly the Omicron versus Delta still in the community because of the clinical applications, uh, because uh, as you mentioned, some monoclonal antibodies don't work against the uh, uh, each variant, and so we want to know if we could use that uh, clinically. And then the other thing, at, towards the end, um, when you talked about, uh, you know, whether or not this was accepted, it reminds me in 2013 when we started doing FMT for C. difficile, and many colleagues said that's barbaric, uh, recognizing it is literally a lot of stuff we're putting into people. And that was going to be my question. Um, besides using this for disease, are you planning on using this technology to look at pockets of, of good behavior where maybe the quantity of bacteroides is high? Uh, so, so that's, we're, we're still fighting the, the COVID pandemic, but um, I mean, absolutely, the, building the list of things that are interesting to look at. Um, we've not been so, haven't been so diligent looking for the good the good guys, but we we definitely need to do that. I, I think a lot of the interest right now is um, these other kinds of exposures that people have, right? And um, you know, I know that we have a great history in our institute focused on air pollution. And so we've been looking at urinary metabolites for volatile organic compound exposure. These these other exposures and behaviors uh, we know intersect, right? And so if we have high smoking rates and we have COVID, I mean, we you know we might have a very different picture, right? And so I, th I think we're re we're there. But I love the positive energy, you know, like could we have a healthy gut? I do think of the sewers as the collective gut of Louisville, right? So we have the whole <laughs> gut, and we want to know whether its uh, microbiome is healthy. So I, I really appreciate that. All right, if anyone has any questions, you can um, unmute and ask, or if you want to type it in the chat area, that's, uh, that would, that's a great spot as well. There was a comment earlier uh, from uh, Dr. Stanley Levinson, one of our re uh, retired researchers, says, a very clear lecture, thank you, said, very nice work you're doing. Said, I'm glad to see your sequencing. Said, please comment, I frequently read and hear that PCR is the gold standard for identifying SARS-CoV-2. Did you know the gold standard is PCR followed by sequencing? Otherwise, medical providers should be aware there are many false positives. Uh, moreover, the generic, the, moreover, the genetic variant is very important. Yeah, there, there are um, <clears throat> there are small uh, tribal wars going on. 
field, if you can imagine it. So uh, one of them is about uh, PCR platforms versus genomic sequencing. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised there are people who made their entire careers in molecular biology just working with PCR platforms. And so they're, they're pretty adamant that there's no problem the PCR machine can't solve. Um, I'm obviously a convert working with our team here at the university that um, you know, we're really seeing a much more comprehensive picture when we sequence. We don't get the advantages of quantifying, right? So when we sequence this stuff, we don't know how much of it is present. So we're missing. So they're really complementary is the truth. But, um, you know, we, it's not cheap, as you know, uh, to sequence. Um, and so, you know, that's been part of the, part of the debate is, you know, what's, what's a feasible and practical solution that's useful and helpful. All right. Uh, any any uh, any more questions? Any other questions for Dr. Smith? Again, you can uh, unmute and ask, or if you want to type it in the chat area, that's uh, that's another option as well. Lots of kudos uh, to your presentation uh, is what I'm seeing, Ted. Um, a lot of people say, th uh, you know, amazing presentation, and it re and it really is. Um, I guess uh, I was also impressed that. Um, that Louisville could, uh, with your all's work, uh, update the governor and, you know, help him with his press conference and things like that. I think that shows uh, a good community service and uh, keeping our uh, legislators understanding the science. So I want to say thank you thank for that. You. No, it's it's been a real privilege and it's been, it's been so much fun. I mean, it's hard to describe a pandemic as fun, but it has been fun to learn things with others for sure. Hey, Ted, right, Jason. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Hey, Ted. Great talk. It's Jason. Um, quick question for you. I think it's interesting and probably really important for the approach to start normalizing to the amount of people that your sample is probably including, right? You talked about that. So I was just curious, what are some of your ideas or thoughts about how to start getting at that? Well, um, so, so we have been using um, uh, uh, plant virus, uh, the pepper, um, Mild model, pepper model, mild. PMMOV is what we call it. Um, and so, you know, that's a virus that, you know, is commonly found in peppers. And, and so um, that can be a proxy. It's, it's imperfect, right, because people have different dietary patterns. So it's, it's not a, a, you know, gold standard one to one relationship, but it definitely can help you get in the ballpark. And, and inside baseball on Jefferson County, we have combined sewers in some parts of our sewer system, which means they also include stormwater. And so in a rain event, that, that becomes a material concern, right? So if you have these areas that are getting massively diluted, we could interpret that as a decline in infection, right? Because we just see less virus, right? So, so we've been using PMMOV, we've looked at cross assembly phage, uh, a handful of other things. They really are imperfect. The, uh, we're working with the EPA in Cincinnati on fecal indicators and, you know, sort of how, how useful they are. Uh, our team uh, uh, over uh, over here in Envirome uh, has been working with breakdown products of serotonin. It's 5-HIA. Um, that seems to be promising. So there's some good emerging literature that we can look at, you know, sort of serotonin products, breakdown products as, um, as a proxy of people. And so, you know, that involves heading over to the mass spectrometer, right? So the one the fun thing about working at R1 University is it's just a matter of whether we turn left when we go down the hall or turn right. So we go down the hall and then we turn right and we go and put it on the mass spec, right? A lot of laboratories across the country, I mean, they just have one tool, right? And they say, well, what can I do with this tool? Um, so, you know, we're, I think we're very fortunate that we can apply multiple approaches. So, yeah, I would, I would say we're working on that. Serotonin um, uh, breakdown is, is, a, is a promising area. Perfect. Thank you. Good point. Ted, I've got one more. Um, I, I could probably talk to you forever. Um, Jack Gilbert, who first introduced uh, me to the uh, genetic uh, sequencing of stool and PCR over a decade ago, reported that households with animals that live inside the home and go in and out are healthier in general. And so he, he was able to correlate. And so you had mentioned the, uh, at, towards the end, all the animals obviously in the sewer. If, if I don't, you know, obviously the devil's in the details here, but it would be neat to see if um, SARS-CoV-2 or whatever you're looking at um, also correlated with 
uh, neighborhoods that had, you know, more, more, more animals. And obviously, I know that's tough because rats and cockroaches aren't necessarily our pets. Right, right. No, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. You know, um, white-tailed deer here in Kentucky are a, a well-known harbor for SARS. Um, and so, you know, we, we've talked to the state's veterinarian about how we might understand where we could intercept, you know, the contribution that they make. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it is, it's definitely a zoo out there. And we, you know, we, we need a strategy to think about the zoo. And a lot of us have just had the privilege of just working with the people. But, you know, I think we're, we're going to work across species here for a little bit. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Any other Thank questions you, for Ted? Appreciate the work you do. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So this is wonderful and very timely, and it's great work you guys are doing, and I really appreciate it. Good day. Thanks a bunch. Thanks a bunch. And uh, go ahead and stop the thing.